Oh, I'm Ben Wattenberg. Have we all turned into performance artists? The Unabomber, O.J. Simpson, Lady Di, Bill Clinton, and Monica Lewinsky. What do these sagas tell us about our culture, our public life, and most importantly, about ourselves? Plenty, says Neil Gabler in his controversial new book, Life, the Movie, How Entertainment Conquered Reality, starring everyone. Gabler is also the author of Winchell, Gossip, Power, and the Culture of Celebrity. To discuss this matter with Neil Gabler, Think Tank is joined by Peter Biskin, the former editor-in-chief of American Film Magazine and the author of Easy Riders, Raging Bulls, How the Sex, Drugs, and Rock and Roll Generation Saved Hollywood. The topic before the house has entertainment conquered reality. This week on Think Tank. Americans like to be entertained. Every year they spend billions on movies, magazines, and video games. Entertainment, it seems, is big, very big business. The celebrity culture pervades our television, our movies, and our magazines. Are you ready for our tete-a-tete? I am absolutely ready. The recent Woody Allen movie Celebrity catalogs man's desire to be famous to be on the other side of the flashbulbs. You can learn a lot about a society by who it chooses to celebrate. These days, the celebrity culture is not limited to the movies. News events have become theater with stars and lights and cameras. OJ against the system, Clinton against Star. And sometimes you can watch the news live on the 24-hour news networks, whether it's a suicide on a freeway or bombs dropping on Iraq. The computer revolution has brought shopping, games, live video, and global communication into your living room or even onto your commuter train. Some argue that this is not new. Newspaper, movies, and television have all been with us for a while, and while the global reach of media brings them closer to us, the stars of today are really not much different from yesterday's heroes of film or gridiron or politics. Is this fascination with entertainment just a logical extension of our past, or has entertainment and media transformed our entire culture? Neil Gabler argues that entertainment has conquered reality. He cites as an example of reality being more entertaining than Hollywood the hit movie The Truman Show, where Jim Carrey's life is watched by millions. Now, in its 30th great year, it's the Truman Show! Gentlemen, Peter Biskin, Neil Gabler, thank you for joining us. Uh, Neil, uh, here we are sitting in a public television (laughs) studio designed to look like a uh, a, a, uh, 19th century English (laughs) library, uh, which is uh, in uh, Sherlington, Virginia, uh, which is an appropriate place to talk about uh, your your thesis about life the movie everything is turned into entertainment so why don't you just give us the uh, the short take on, on what your thought is well in a nutshell I think that that entertainment has become the primary value of American life and in the process of that happening it's been a long process life itself has become an entertainment medium and we are all audience for and performance artists in an ongoing show that really never ends now our our, our Performance may end, of course, we all play a death scene, but the show keeps on going. And I think this gets manifested in in three basic ways. One, real-life melodramas like O.J. Simpson and the Unabomber and Monica Lewinsky have superseded, to a large extent, conventional entertainments. And two, I think that institutions in America, whether it's journalism or politics or religion, uh, have all been, been driven by the entertainment imperative. And three, I think in our own personal lives, the notion of performance and self-presentation has become increasingly important. Peter Biskin, what do you think about that? Well, I think uh, there's a lot of truth to this. Um, And I do think that uh, entertainment values have made uh, inroads into um, real life and reality. But I think it's a a vast overstatement to say that uh, real life has become um, 
uh, a sort of ancillary to entertainment values. I mean, I think, for example, I mean, it depends. I mean, there are kind of complicated, and a lot of complicated and slippery issues here. And when when you said that uh, the melodrama of Monica Lewinsky had, um, uh, uh, I mean, it brought to mind um, the failure of um, the Mike Nichols film *Primary Colors*, which which mm -hmm. came out right after the Lewinsky story mm -hmm. broke. Um, everybody was wondering when the film came out, is this going to hurt the film, is it going to help the film? Mm -hmm. and, and obviously it, it, um, it hurt the film. The film was a good movie. But it's, a, it's questionable whether, uh, how, to, how to analyze that, whether it's, a question, whether, it's a f whether it's the fact that the Lewinsky thing was a, mel a melodrama or whether it was a, a question of reality outstripping fiction. Yeah, let, let, me, let me ask. Well, well in some ways, I mean, that is one of the things I'm saying, though, is that I think reality does outstrip fiction and becomes more entertaining than fiction. That fiction, uh, I quote Philip Roth early in the book, uh, where he complained as early as 1960 that it was difficult for a novelist to, to write out of his imagination when reality itself was so much more imaginative, if one wants to call it that, than anything that a novelist could concoct. You say, well, we've all become performance artists and everybody's sort of on camera the way we are in, in the studio as we speak. And yet, uh, my sense of the matter is 99.9% .9 of the people wake up each morning and they do not think they're on camera. They think they have to uh, support a family, go to work, uh, get the kids off to school. And uh, you are extending an interesting thesis uh, beyond where it ought to go. Well, I think everything is a matter of degree and proportion here. But I do believe that we are more self-conscious now. Individual citizens, everyday people, are more self-conscious about their own lives, about their self-presentation than any previous generation has been. And I'll give you an example. I'll give you two quick examples. Uh, I've been on the road a lot, you know, talking about my book, and I've been, done a lot of radio call-in shows. You got the rap down pretty well. I, well, I, I don't know about that. It. It's just, you know, <laughs> you've been through it also. And you're about, go ahead. And, and I did one call-in show just recently, and a fellow called in and he said, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a janitor at this mall and it was in, in Minnesota. And he said, and I was listening to the broadcast, and he said, and I was thinking, you know, in some ways, you know, I'm the set designer here at this mall. Uh, and, you know, it, indeed, he was, he, he was thinking in, in these terms. And I talked to another woman on another call and show, this one in San Francisco. She was a housewife. And she said, I'm here folding my laundry, and I've got two young kids at, at my feet. And this is really drudge work. But I'll tell you how I, I get through this. I imagine that I'm in that scene that you often see in movies, where the mother is folding laundry and there are two kids at her feet and it's a very domestic scene and it's very warm uh, and, and it's very life affirming. She said, and I'm the audience, my, my own audience for the scene and I feel very, you know, it's very life affirming for me as I do this because otherwise it would be really difficult to have to do this day after day after day after day. Well, sure, we, we would all prefer to be in movies than in real, I mean, live in movies in real life, because if only because movies have happy endings, which real life, unfortunately, <laughs> now <they> do. doesn't. <laughs> now they do. But, you know, um, I just, I just um, came out with a book, um, uh, uh, not to steal any of your thunder, <laughs> uh, about all. Hollywood in the 70s. And one of the interesting things about it was that these guys who were called movie brats, because they, they were young kids who went to learn about life essentially at film school, and um, uh, all of them, Imagine that they were living that their own lives were movies. They um, and and the, you know they would if, if um, uh, they got tired of a wife they would just exchange it and turn it in for a new one. They imagined they could sort of edit their lives as they went mm -hmm. along, and if they made a bad cut, they would just throw the film out and make mm -hmm. another one. And all of them, almost it's every the single one. The advantage of the new tape technology, <laughs> <to> have <laughs> exactly. <a> machine, <laughs> having <laughs> one hundred, you can just yeah, <laughs> exactly. right. right. But the point I want to make is that almost every single one f learned to his sorrow, and uh, actually it was all men, that life, is, that life is not a movie. Peter Bogdanovich was um, uh, the one who, who finally came out and said this. When his girlfriend, Dorothy Stratton, was killed, he was walking down, it was a terrible tragedy, he was walking down the street in Beverly Hills, ran, uh, came upon Billy Wilder, and Billy Wilder started talking to him about what a great script that would make. And <laughs> Peter was like appalled and thought, you know, my life is not a, you know, my life is not a movie. And, you know, all of them learned that finally there was a distinction between life and movies. And I think that's really true. Yeah. Well, maybe they lived the wrong movie. I mean, you know, the one could make the, the case that they simply were looking for the wrong plot elements using, in Hollywood, where everything gets intensified and, and things often get skewed, they were borrowing the wrong elements to shape their movie. Whereas, you know, ordinary people who have more modest ambitions, more modest goals, 
you know, learn to, to you know, make a, a more modest film for I, themselves, if I, you want to use I, that I, I was thinking about your uh, tales of the call-in shows. You know, I have, a, I have Wattenberg's first rule of, uh, of publishing, which is do the call-in show before the book. You learn, <laughs> you learn a lot. I, I've, always wished, I've always wished that I could do that. You get all, all, all the good feedback. How, how does this play out in, in your mind and in your book? In, in, in the realm, say, of politics. I know you, you deal with that and have a problem, I think, with it. Why, why don't you... Uh... Well, I think it, it's played itself out. And again, the things I describe are not revolutionary, they're evolutionary. So, you know, what I'm describing is not some sudden break with the past, but really a continuity with the past. But I think we've seen, you know, over certainly the last, you know, 35 or 40 years, at least since John Kennedy and probably before then, that politics has increasingly become a branch of entertainment where politicians have increasingly deployed the techniques of entertainment, largely because television has now entered the, the scene, and you have to appeal to, to television. You have to play to television in order to reach your constituency. And we've seen, I, I think, that campaigns have increasingly been converted into narratives with conflict, the whole notion of the contest element being raised above the issue element in most campaigns because it's more entertaining. When we talk about who's got the momentum, who's winning, who's losing, polls, fastening on polls. And I think that finally, what's, what's I think most, most pernicious, if you want to call it that, if, if, if one thinks of this whole process as being pernicious, is that it's, it's invaded the presidency itself. So it's not just a matter of well, campaigns. Give me an example of that. I, you're, you're pretty tough on Ronald Reagan. In this I don't book. think I, well, see, I don't think I'm tough well, on Reagan. Well, wh why don't you tell me what um, you say about what, Reagan? What I say and, about and Reagan. I will proceed to bash you okay, upon well, the well, head. Well, I don't, okay, because right. I, I, don't, I don't say, what I say about Reagan is this, that Reagan not only understood theatrical arts, as Kennedy did, but he understood something in some ways that was far more significant. He understood that if he was going to play the president, that the presidency itself could be a movie, and that the presidency could function in the same way that movies function and with the same ends that movies have, which is to make an audience feel good. Now, you say I bash Reagan. My feeling is that, you know, there's a lot of good sense in that. Well, but you, you, you say, and you say it about uh, other politicians also, just in, in, in fairness, that all it was was a movie, that it had no substance to it, that it was just, you know, uh, Reagan the movie. Well, you say and, all and, it was. And, 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 well, mm. that's a paraphrase, but it's pretty close. <laughs> I mean, in point of fact, while I might accept everything you just said about Reagan, here's a guy who took office saying he wants to uh, win the Cold War mm -hmm. by rearming America, mm -hmm. that he wants to uh, uh, expound upon the magic of the market in America and around the world. Uh, and two or three, he wanted to deregulate American industry, two, three, four things and did all the showbiz that goes with it. I grant you that. But you know, funny thing happened. Eight years later, he had done it. Now, these were monumental substantive uh, uh, accomplishment. I mean, I'm sort of pro Reagan. You could d deny that they were, but but they certainly were not non-substantive or just you know some some uh, allegedly grade B movie actor playing games with us. No, well, I, first of all, I, I mean, I, I disagree with that characterization. Um, and I think you know if, if you if you read the book that way, in some ways, I think it's because we we all bring our kind of prejudice to to the Reagan presidency. I know uh, that. Yeah. And and you know what I say about Reagan is this. I mean that I believe he understood what people wanted from the presidency. That was a very valuable understanding. There, I don't say that he was completely non-substantive. What I do say is that many of the policies that were substantive were cast in movie rhetoric, like the evil empire or the Star Wars anti-missile yeah, system. I, I wanted to ask you, hold, hold on, that, that I'm, 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 I want to ask you, um, what is your problem with evil empire? What is it not, was it not evil or not an empire? I have no problem with it. You have no problem, but you, no. sort, of, you sort of, Dump no, I'm, on I'm it in the book. You no. put it in quotes. You say, "Ah, oh, look at this no, dummy." No, no, I don't. I, no? Again, I think that you know, I, I think you're bringing something to it that's not there. In fact, I have enormous respect for for this idea, and it's a very powerful idea. You know, it's, you can't just ignore the fact that people want to feel good about this country. They want to feel good about themselves, and that Reagan understood that. And that Reagan, in making the presidency into a movie, you know, one could say, "Well, in doing that, I mean, that's ridiculous. I mean, that kind of trivializes everything." But one could also look at it the other way and say, rather than trivialize everything, it gets right to the heart of what people may want from their presidency, which is to feel good about this country and feel good about well, themselves. Well, you know, I, I, I actually dislike the Reagan presidency, but I have to agree with um, Ben in the sense, you know, there was one statement that you made in the book which I thought was very revealing, which is uh, essentially you said that in the Reagan presidency, um, 
entertainment uh, trumped ideology. In other words, it wasn't a question of the right mm -hmm. um, uh, defeating the left after years of um, you know, FDR right. liberalism and New Deal liberalism. It was the fact that entertainment trumped both left and right. Mm -hmm. And that, I, I agree. I mean, Reagan may, I mean, it's, it seems almost the opposite is the case. Reagan, Reagan injected more ideology, made more substantive changes for good or for ill um, than um, had been seen in the presidency in a long time. So I think you could sort of turn your thesis upside down. I mean, he did use entertainment values in presenting and selling this, his ideological um, agenda to the American mm -hmm. people, but that's very different from saying that there was no substance to it. Well, again, I, the word substance is not one. I never use the word that it's non-substantive. And, and I'm, I, I, in some ways, I feel like I'm, I, I'm arguing you know, a non-argument here because I, I agree with what you're saying. I mean, I, I think that entertainment can trump ideology. And, and how does it trump ideology? Because it supersedes it. He framed issues, even ideological issues, almost in an entertainment way. Right against left became, as I, and this I do say in the book, it's kind of like cowboys against Indians. I mean, it was a very interesting way of framing issues. It was a way of framing issues ideologically that was almost non-ideological. What about Clinton? Fast. Okay, is, Clinton's is a different kind of entertainer. I mean, there's no question in my estimation that Clinton is an entertainer. But, but it, I, in, I refer to him in the book as kind of postmodernist because he operates out of what uh, the, the cultural historian Neil Harris called a, an operational aesthetic. And, and Harris at the time was referring to P.T. Barnum. Operational aesthetic was that you showed the audience, you know, that you were pulling the strings and manipulating them. I think in some ways, I mean, this is what Clinton does with, with his audience. I mean, Clinton is... Is, is manipulating us, manipulating you know, the, the process. And we all kind of sit back and you know, not everyone says, geez, they admire that, but we all kind of sit back and in some ways are entertained by it. Are entertained by the fact that you know, we're watching Clinton manipulate the system and he does it so baldly that you kind of shake your head and you say, well, you know, <laughs> you throw up your hands. And at. the story becomes the manipulation. The story about, in, in the same way that it does with Madonna, for example. I mean, Madonna and Bill Clinton are very similar figures. What Madonna does in entertainment, in conventional entertainment, which is to show her transformations and her manipulations and make that the entertainment, rather than her singing or dancing or whatever, or her, or her acting. You know, Clinton does the same thing, I think, in politics. Well, I want to go back to this example of Monica Gate. I mean, there was a, I think it's an interesting um, um, test case for your thesis, because when, um, you know, after the revelations, uh, all the um, political commentators were flummoxed by the fact that uh, Clinton's ratings went up. <laughs> and I remember reading the New Yorker an article by Kurt Anderson who said, you know, well, the reason is because it's a soap, you know, the Clinton, the ongoing um, Clinton um, uh, revelations are a soap and the plot mm. has gotten more interesting. Mm. Therefore, the ratings go up. The soap opera, yeah. Therefore, the ratings go up. And that seemed to me, uh, again, to turn it upside down, it seemed to me that the, 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 in fact, the ratings went up. Bec I mean, Clinton's popularity ratings went mm -hmm. up because people in f could, in fact, distinguish between uh, Monica Gate and reality, and they and they uh, were tired of the of the soap, if you will, if you want to call it that. And in fact, they were very able to distinguish between the two, whereas it were, and, and not at, you know, and not at all. Uh, unable to, which is the thesis, I think, that, you know, of this, um, you know, a entertainment cannibalizing reality. Well, I, I, I think they did make, I think the public made a distinction, but I'm not sure it's the distinction between reality. After all, I mean, Monica Gate is, is and was playing out in reality. I mean, it was right. what I, in the book, I call a lifey, which is, you know, a movie written in the medium of life. But I think the distinction the public made, the distinction I made is that this is entertainment, and they can enjoy it as entertainment. Kurt Anderson's word, you know, he called the presidency the entertainer-in-chief. Um, in, in the New Yorker, but the, in terms of consequences, real consequences, the public didn't want to see this entertainment have consequences. In the same way that when you watch a movie, I mean, you, the movie may linger with you after you leave the theater, but you, know, you don't want the movie to, to, to leave the theater with you and have consequences on real life outside the theater. Now, the difference here, of course, is that this movie is, is actually played out in real life. You also say that religion has become an entertainment. Again, I, I don't want to oversell this idea. What, what I'm saying is that I think religion, you know, has, has assumed elements of entertainment. Uh, look at the megachurch movement, for example, in this country. Uh, I mean, the megachurch movement, which are these giant churches, uh, now, you know, pride themselves on the kind of music they have, frequently rock music. There are actually, you know, kind of churches compete with one another over the quality of the bands that they have performing at the services. They have light shows, which are very much like 
uh, rock concerts at, uh, at Madison Square Garden or whatever, you know, any of the big rock venues across the country. They even have cappuccino carts now, I understand, at some of these uh, you know, churches. But, but it's not only at that level. Uh, I was speaking not long ago at, at a Jewish service. And one of the heads of the Can, of can the you synagogue. take communion with, uh, with cappuccino? I, I, I don't know. That's, that's <laughs> right, an interesting right, question. Right, right. And one that right. only this generation right, will have right, had to right. have confronted. Yeah, you, yeah, I'm sorry. You were <laughs> saying about a... Uh, but I was, I was speaking at a, at a Jewish uh, service, and one of the leaders of the synagogue came up to me afterwards and was talking about the, the wonderful rabbi that they had who was coming to officiate at the high holiday services. And, and he, and, and quite consciously, I mean, he knew exactly what he was saying. I mean, the, the reason that this rabbi was so terrific is that he packed him in. He was a great showman. He had great sermons and he was very stirring and people loved the show. And, and those were exactly the words he used. People love the show. Now this is not new. L let me ask you this. You say the United States has become the Republic of Entertainment. Yes. It's an interesting, uh, interesting phrase. Uh, what's wrong with that? I mean, isn't there, 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 there's enough sadness in life the whole, the whole thing is, uh, you said it ends with a death scene, it's not, <laughs> not a piece of cake. Uh, what on earth is, is wrong with seeking out entertainment and shouldn't we salute the fact that we have more and better kinds of entertainment? On the face of it, absolutely nothing is wrong with that. And one of the things I'm at pains to say in the book, and I've taken some heat for this, you know, is the fact that the book is diagnostic rather than prescriptive. I'm a fan of entertainment. Uh, I, w I myself was a film reviewer for, for a number of years, and, and I wasn't one of these film reviewers who only like European movies. I love entertainment. I love movies. I love rock music. Uh, I even like trashy novels. So is there anything wrong with it? No. On the face of it, absolutely not. Does it have some, some deleterious effects on American society? It can. Not necessarily, but it can, and I think it has. Now, one then has to balance the positive effects you know, versus the, the negative effects. And I don't think one says, well, then we ought to get rid of entertainment or, or marginalize it in some way. I think one ought to be aware of these things so that one can make decisions about the kind of society in which one wants to live. You think this is good or bad insofar as it exists, Peter? Well, I mean, I think that uh, uh, there's nothing wrong with entertainment, God knows, but it's true that entertainment run rampant. And if it's true that it, you know, uh, as Neil maintains, that it hollows out sort of traditional value systems, I think, um, can't be good. But I think, again, I mean, there's a lot of different ways of looking at this. I think entertainment uh, carries, uh, the entertainment values um, carry audiology as well. And I think that um, more attention has to be paid with the way the values that entertainment bears or carries interacts with tradi more traditional mm -hmm. ideologies. I mean, there are other ways of, you could turn this whole thing upside down and you could look at, for example, you could argue that ideology and politics permeates Hollywood movies, things mm -hmm. that appear to be solely entertaining. A movie like um, Titanic, for example, carries a whole populist baggage, which is pretty clear cut. Even even horror movies mm -hmm. or science fiction movies. A lot like of conservatives have been saying that Hollywood carries ideology absolutely. for a long and, time. And a lot of it's yeah. true. And, it, and it's true. <laughs> I mean, even films like that, that seem to be completely ideologically free, like this uh, current movie called The Faculty, which is a remake of Invasion of the Body mm -hmm. Snatchers, set in a high school. Uh, when the uh, aliens take over, there's a pan of a hallway, and you, s you look into a classroom, and you see all the students have their hands up. Mm -hmm. That's an indication to the director that, you know, they've become <laughs> alienized, you know. <laughs> and that's a political statement, in, in some sense, about education. So anyway, I, there's, there, there are a lot of different ways to look at this phenomenon. This is a, uh, a PBS program, all right? And you have been making a distinction, and, uh, and so has Peter, between entertainment and information. Now, my question is, haven't all these entertainment arts that we have uh, really brought to a level that has never been seen before, both in terms of quality and, and quantity, uh, hasn't it also or can't it also serve as a great agent of information? And I, I'm not preaching from a mountaintop down to the, the deluded masses. I mean, I want to make that absolutely clear. I'm, I'm down with those deluded masses. <laughs> I'm one of them. I think the only qualification I would make is that entertainment can create habits of mind which can marginalize serious things. Not everything is entertaining. Not all serious issues are entertaining. Well, n not, not every movie is a smiley face either. There are, there are tragic movies, there, there's a lot of sordid movies. I mean, it may be entertainment in the sense that you lose yourself in it, but, but it, it's, it's uh, I mean, tragedy, 
Tragedy is not comedy, and you can quote me on that. I mean, uh, <laughs> I mean, and, and you, you see a lot. Limb. Yeah, right. <laughs> Tough stuff. But, but entertainment, I think, you know, the most entertaining movies. I mean, if we look even at box office, and Peter can speak to this better than I, are those that have you know kind of clear narrative lineaments, uh, a clear beginning, middle, and end. Good guys and bad guys uh, that have nowadays you know sensational components that can you know grab grab an audience and keep you know hold an audience's attention. And again, there's nothing wrong with any of those things. I'm not arguing against those things. But I'm saying that not everything conforms to those kinds of, of you know, elements. And we've got to be aware of that. OK, we are out of time. We have to be aware of that. Uh, thank you very much, uh, thank you. Neil Gabler and Peter Biskin. And thank you. For Think Tank, I'm Ben Wattenberg. We at Think Tank depend on your views to make our show better. Please send your questions and comments to New River Media, 1150 17th Street Northwest, Washington, D.C., 20036. Or email us at thinktank at pbs.org. To learn more about Think Tank, visit PBS online at www.pbs.org. And please let us know where you watch Think Tank. This has been a production of BJW Incorporated in association with New River Media, which are solely responsible for its content.